Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Financial Wellness, the podcast dedicated to helping physicians in Michigan turn their professional success into financial success while enjoying life along the way. And now, here are your hosts, Andrew Mushbaugh and Trent DeBruin. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Physician's Guide to Financial Wellness. This is Trent DeBruin, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Andrew Mushbaugh. And today, we're going to walk you through our year-end financial planning checklist. So this is a list of different financial planning items that we've found are helpful to revisit or address as you approach the end of the year when looking to optimize things with your finances. As you'll see, some of them are more tangible in nature, some are more qualitative, and some apply to specific situations. But our goal with this episode is to provide some useful food for thought and things to consider or confirm in the final couple months of the year. And Andrew, I'm assuming one of your big items is making sure you've earmarked a bucket of money for Michigan football national championship tickets. (laughs) Yeah, that bucket is pre-funded every August, just in case. Well, you have been saying this is the year for a few years now. Eh, Only about 30 plus years. Well, you'll be ready when the time comes. So outside of funding your bucket for Michigan football tickets, why don't you kick things off by sharing our first checklist item? Sure. But before I do that, it's worth noting that this isn't meant to be an exhaustive checklist. Instead, it's making sure you're capitalizing on all the quote-unquote low-hanging fruit before the end of the calendar year. So with that in mind, the first item on our list is related to saving money on taxes, which is to confirm your contributions to your employer retirement accounts, like 403Bs, 457Bs, or 401Ks, and see whether you're on pace to make the maximum allowed contribution for the calendar year. As we've talked about in several different episodes in the past, employer retirement accounts are one of the best tools when it comes to tax planning and lowering the amount of taxes you have to pay. By making pre-tax contributions to these accounts, assuming that makes sense for you, each $1 you contribute lowers your taxable income by $1, which saves you $1 times whatever your marginal tax rate is in taxes. For example, if you're a Michigan physician in the 32% federal tax bracket, each $1 you contribute to your 403B or 401k will save you $0.32 in federal taxes and another 4.25 cents in state taxes, since the Michigan state income tax rate is 4.25%. Knowing that the 2022 contribution limit to a 403B, 457B, or 401k is $20,500 for anyone under age 50, and $27,000 for anyone age 50 and older, you can see how quickly the tax savings can add up by making the maximum contributions to these accounts. So what you want to do with this first checklist item is to see how much you've contributed to your account so far this year, and what you're on pace to contribute for the remainder. Logistically, there are several ways you can find this information, but it's often easiest to look at your most recent pay stub because it shows you both A, what you've contributed so far this year, and B, what you contribute each paycheck, which allows you to see if you're on pace to maximize your retirement accounts. If you find that you aren't on pace to make the maximum contribution and would like to, now is a good opportunity to increase your per paycheck contribution to allow you to hit the maximum for the year, or at least get closer than you otherwise would have. And the reason you want to do this sooner rather than later is that you may still have paychecks remaining for the year which means you may still have time to adjust your contribution amount. Now, having said all that, we also want to mention that you don't necessarily have to max out all of your retirement accounts each year. The amount you should be saving for retirement will be based on your unique situation, stage of life, and goals. But for those of you who want to and are able to max out their employer retirement accounts, now is a good time to confirm that and make any adjustments if needed. And one last item worth mentioning is that the IRS periodically increases the maximum contribution limits for retirement accounts. Typically, it increases by $500 or $1,000 every year or two. Although for next year in 2023, the 403B and 401k contribution limit is going to be increased by $2,000 if you're under 50 and $3,000 if you're 50 or older. So even if you are on pace to max out your retirement accounts in the prior year, that won't necessarily remain the case if the limit is increased. So it's always worth at least doing this check-in to confirm your contributions relative to the maximum allowed contribution limit. In keeping with the theme of retirement accounts, the next item on our checklist is making your backdoor Roth IRA contribution if you're planning to make one and haven't already. As a quick refresher, if your income is above a certain threshold, modified adjusted gross income of $214,000 if filing taxes married filing jointly in 2022, you aren't allowed to contribute directly to a Roth IRA and instead have to contribute indirectly using the backdoor Roth IRA method. This consists of making a non-deductible contribution to a traditional IRA and immediately transferring or converting the money to a Roth IRA. By doing this, you don't receive a tax deduction for your contribution, but once the money is in your Roth IRA, it grows tax-free and you never have to pay taxes on it again in the future. So when it comes to retirement savings strategy for physicians, our hierarchy is typically first maxing out all pre-tax accounts, such as 403Bs, 457Bs, and 401Ks, as Andrew just discussed, and then making backdoor Roth IRA contributions after that. 
The reason for this is that your tax bracket during your working years is likely higher than it will be in retirement when your income is lower and you're withdrawing from your accounts. And therefore, those pre-tax contributions are most valuable right now. So if contributing to a backdoor Roth IRA is part of your financial plan, we recommend checking whether you've made your backdoor Roth IRA contribution for the year. And if you haven't, and you have the cash to make it, going ahead and doing it before year end. There are a couple reasons for this, but one of them is to keep things easier when it comes to tax reporting. When making a backdoor Roth IRA contribution, there are two items that get reported for tax purposes. One, the non-deductible IRA contribution itself, and two, the conversion of the money from your traditional IRA to your Roth IRA. Well, you have until April 15th of the following year to make your contribution, i.e. you have until April 15th of 2023 to make your 2022 backdoor Roth IRA contribution. If you make the contribution in the following calendar year, the tax reporting gets a bit more complicated because you'll end up reporting the contribution on your 2022 return, but the conversion on your 2023 return. This can get confusing even if you work with an accountant for your taxes, but even more so if you prepare them yourself. In addition to simplicity, the other reason we prefer to make backdoor Roth IRA contributions before year end is to guard against an unknown future. Tax legislation changes over time, and as recently as last year, it looked like there was going to be a change that would eliminate the backdoor Roth IRA as a retirement saving strategy. So if you're planning to contribute and are able to now, it's always nice to just do it. The 2022 IRA contribution limit is $6,000 if you're under age 50 and $7,000 if you're 50 or older. And similar to 401ks and 403bs, the IRS gradually increases these limits. For example, in 2023, these limits will increase to $6,500 and $7,500 respectively. And one side note on the backdoor Roth IRA strategy, if you have existing money in a pre-tax IRA, maybe from rolling over an old 403b or 401k from a previous employer, you can run into issues with something called the pro rata rule when trying to make your backdoor Roth IRA contribution. So if this is relevant for you, you'll want to make sure you consult with a financial or tax professional before making these contributions. Now, switching gears from retirement savings in the alphabet or number soup of retirement account names, we'll move on to college savings and another random number to remember, which is a 529 account. As we've talked about in prior episodes, a 529 account is like a retirement account, but for college savings. We know this won't be relevant for everyone, but for those of you who are saving for college, this is an important account to be aware of. A 529 account allows you to save and invest money in a tax advantage way and ultimately stretch your college savings dollars as far as possible. And while most people tend to think of saving for college for their kids with 529s, anyone can open one, including grandparents or aunts and uncles. And 529s are different than retirement accounts in that there's no limit to how much you can contribute each year. However, certain states offer state income tax deductions for contributions, and there's a limit to that tax deduction amount each year. And I should probably back up for a quick second before moving past contribution limits. While there aren't contribution limits per se, there are things to be aware of if you're planning to make a large lump sum contribution, like $80,000 or more, because of gift tax considerations. We won't go into the weeds here, but wanted to at least point that out. So moving back to state tax deductions, Michigan allows you to deduct up to $10,000 of contributions to the Michigan 529, called the Michigan Education Savings Program, each year if you file a tax return married filing jointly. And the $10,000 worth of contributions is cumulative. So even if you have multiple 529 accounts for multiple kids, you're still only allowed to deduct up to $10,000 of total contributions. And it's important to note that the state tax deduction for Michigan is based on net contributions to your 529 plan. In other words, if you put in $10,000 in 2022 and took out $10,000 in 2022, your eligible tax deduction would be $0. So you'll want to factor in the timing of contributions and withdrawals to maximize the state tax deductions. Knowing the Michigan state income tax rate is 4.25%, Ten thousand dollars worth of contributions saves you four hundred and twenty-five dollars of state income taxes each year. Now, when it comes to college planning, the amount you're going to save to a five twenty-nine each year will depend on the specifics of the college goal, public or private, in state or out of state, what percentage you want to pay for, etc. And because of that, each person's required savings amount will be different. However, for the purposes of this year-end checklist item, you want to confirm how much you've contributed year to date relative to both your target savings amount and the $10,000 limit, at least in Michigan, if you're looking to maximize tax deductions. If you find that you're behind target and you have the cash, you have plenty of time to quote-unquote top up your 529 contributions before year-end by making additional contributions. One other thing worth mentioning, with all saving and investing goals, we always recommend automating your savings whenever possible. So an easy way to remove this item from your checklist in future years is to automate your 529 contributions. 
Assuming you have the monthly cash flow to do it, we find it's easiest to set up a recurring monthly contribution amount that, when stretched out over the course of the entire year, will allow you to hit your 529 savings targets for the year, whether that's hitting the $10,000 deduction limit or some other amount you're targeting. And the other way to remove this item from your checklist is to assume your child or grandchild is going to get a full ride athletic scholarship, correct? Yeah, that's correct. 529 plan savings are a good plan B, though. <laughs> it's good to have a plan B. Another account-related checklist item we want to cover pertains to some of the less discussed accounts you often find as part of the benefits offered by your employer, which are flexible spending accounts and health savings accounts. Starting with flexible spending accounts, or FSAs, there are two different types, healthcare and dependent care. The way these accounts work is that you're able to contribute money from your paycheck, up to the IRS limits, receive a tax deduction for your contributions, federal, state, and payroll taxes, and once the money is in the account, you can use it to pay for qualifying out-of-pocket health care or dependent care expenses, such as co-pays or deductibles for health care or child care for dependent care. Now, in terms of contributing to the accounts, you make that decision once a year at open enrollment time in the fall. So for our year-end checklist, we're not checking the contributions to these accounts, but we're instead checking on the account balances. The reason why is that FSAs are use-it-or-lose-it accounts, where if you don't spend the money from the account within the calendar year, plus potentially a grace period depending on your employer, you lose the money and it's gone forever. Because of this, if you're planning to contribute to an FSA, we always recommend setting your contributions at a level that will match your expected health care or dependent care costs. But either way, knowing we're approaching year-end, this is a great time to go ahead and check your FSA account balances to see where they stand. If there's money in your account, you still have time to spend it on qualifying expenses or reimburse yourself for qualifying expenses you incurred earlier in the year. This will help you avoid the frustrating situation of having to forfeit money in your FSA. Another employer account to check on is the Health Savings Account, or HSA. This account is similar to a healthcare FSA in that you're allowed to contribute money up to the IRS limits, receive a tax deduction for your contributions, then once the money is in the account, you can use it to pay for qualifying healthcare expenses. However, there are some key differences, which is where this checklist item applies. One of the differences is that, unlike an FSA, an HSA isn't a use it or lose it account. So if there's money left over in the account at the end of the year, you can carry it over to future years. Another difference, which is relevant here, is that unlike an FSA, where you can only choose your contribution amount once a year at open enrollment, for an HSA, you can adjust your contribution amount throughout the year, similar to a 403b or 401k. Knowing you can change your contribution at any time, if you have an HSA and are looking to make the maximum contribution to it, now is a good time to go ahead and check your year-to-date contributions and what you're on pace to contribute for the remainder of the year to confirm that you'll end up contributing your desired amount. If you aren't on track, similar to checking your employer retirement contributions, you can adjust your per paycheck contribution to hit your target. For reference, the 2022 HSA contribution limit is $3,650 for an individual and $7,300 for a family, with an additional $1,000 catch-up contribution allowed for people age 55 or older. And keep in mind, these limits are the total amount that can go into the account. We mention this because many employers make a contribution on the employee's behalf, such as $500 or $1,000, so the amount that you can contribute personally is the total contribution limit minus whatever amount your employer contributes on your behalf. And one last thing to note, if your employer offers both an HSA and a healthcare FSA, you're only allowed to participate in one of the two. However, dependent care FSAs are separate, so you can participate in both an HSA and a dependent care FSA. All right, now moving away from some of the various accounts to save to for tax benefits, we'll move on to the next item, which is checking in on your investments. Now, before I touch on the one-time year-end review of your investments, it's worth noting that this is something you would ideally want to be monitoring and managing throughout the course of the year to take advantage of any opportunities that present themselves. But if you haven't been able to do that, then year-end is a great time to take inventory. Or said differently, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, and the next best time is today. So regardless of where you are at with the frequency of reviewing your investments, the first area to look at is whether you should rebalance your portfolio. We discussed this in more detail in episode number 19. But the idea is that each person should have a target investment allocation that matches the specific goal they're investing for. This target allocation includes not only your ratio of stocks and or bonds, but also the specific stock or bond investments you own, like large U.S. stocks, small U.S. stocks, international stocks, etc. Well, you set this target on the front end, but the next day the market moves and different investments perform differently. So your actual investment allocation no longer matches your target allocation. 
over time, your actual allocation can drift far enough away from your target allocation that you'll want to rebalance your portfolio to get back on target. In practice, this consists of selling some of the investments that have performed the best and buying more of the investments that have underperformed. In effect, it's a way of selling high and buying low, but in a disciplined and mechanical way. And the research has shown that rebalancing over time improves your investment performance. We won't elaborate on our specific approach to rebalancing because we know not all of our listeners have the time, interest, or comfort level following the approach. So it's worth noting there are incrementally better ways to rebalance, but any type of rebalance is better than nothing. Well, I should probably back up for a second because it's assuming you rebalance in the right way and any type of rebalancing is then better than nothing. And one thing to keep in mind when it comes to rebalancing is that while there are no tax implications for rebalancing accounts like 403Bs, 401Ks, 457Bs, IRAs, or Roth IRAs, there are potential tax implications for taxable accounts, so you'll want to account for those. Outside of rebalancing, another investment item we recommend reviewing as a part of your year-end checklist is looking for opportunities to do tax loss harvesting. Tax loss harvesting is only relevant if you have a taxable investment account, also known as an individual account, a joint account, or a brokerage account. So if your only investments are those in your IRAs or employer retirement plans, it won't be applicable. However, if you do have a taxable investment account, you'll want to review your investments to see if you have any that are worth less than what you paid for them. If you do, you can sell those investments to recognize the loss and then use it to either lower your taxable income or offset investment gains recognized elsewhere. You're allowed to deduct up to $3,000 of losses per year against your ordinary income. In other words, you can think of this like you were able to make an extra $3,000 retirement contribution, at least in the terms of the tax benefits that it has today. On top of the potential tax deduction today, the other nice benefit is you can carry any unused losses to future years so you can continue to deduct them over time until eventually all of the losses are used up. So for a physician in the 32% tax bracket, deducting $3,000 of losses will save you around $1,000 in federal taxes. Now, one important thing to keep in mind if you do sell an investment is that you'll want to go ahead and buy a different investment in its place. The reason for that is because it's nice to recognize the loss for tax purposes, but you don't want to miss out on the potential of returns by remaining in cash. In other words, if you sold an investment for $100,000 and had $3,000 of losses as a result, yes, you'll get the tax deduction, but what if the market goes up 5% during that period and you've sat in cash? Well, you'd actually be worse off after the tax loss harvesting because you missed out on the investment returns. So this is just another example of not letting the tax tail wag the dog. Which on that note, it's important to understand the rules associated with tax loss harvesting. And the main IRS rule to be aware of is called the wash sale rule. The rule states that if you sell an investment to recognize a loss, you have to then wait 30 days before buying back that same investment, or you'll quote unquote lose the loss for tax purposes. So if you sell an investment to harvest losses, but still want to continue owning that investment, you'll have to wait 30 days before buying it back again. As you can imagine, the opportunities to harvest losses will depend on what's going on in the market and the timing of when you invested the money in your taxable account. During years when the stock market is down, like we've experienced this year, there are more opportunities for taxless harvesting, but either way, year-end is a great time to revisit this. Now transitioning to a somewhat related topic, the next item on our checklist is to review your charitable giving. This is one of those items that may or may not be relevant for you, but if you are charitably inclined, this is a great time of year to check in on your giving from a couple different perspectives. One, hitting your targets, and two, maximizing tax benefits. Starting with the former, Different people are in different situations when it comes to charitable giving, and there's no right or wrong answer since it's a personal decision. But for people who are charitably inclined, we know that many of them like to be consistent and target a certain dollar amount or a certain percentage of their income each year. So if charitable giving is part of your financial plan, this is a good opportunity to review what you've done so far this year and see where you are relative to your target. If you're behind target, there's still plenty of time to give between now and year end to catch up. And the holidays are always full of opportunities to give and make a difference. Going back to the second point we mentioned about maximizing tax benefits, we never want to let the tax tail wag the dog, and we never recommend giving to charity solely for the tax benefits. But if charitable giving is something you're doing anyway, it makes sense to be as efficient as possible from a tax perspective. Because at the very least, that's going to leave more money in your pocket at the end of the day, which, if you want to, you can then choose to give to charity to further amplify your impact. So if when reviewing your charitable activity for the year, you decide you would like to do more, it's worth checking whether there are ways to give in a tax-efficient manner. Now, we have an entire podcast episode on tax-efficient charitable giving, episode number 23, so feel free to check that out if you want a deeper dive. But here, we'll just mention one strategy, which is looking for opportunities to donate appreciated investments. This is relevant if you have a taxable investment account, also referred to as a brokerage account, But it's an account where you can invest money in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, etc. 
And when you go to sell the investments, you pay taxes on the difference between what you paid for them and what they're worth. So what you can do is, assuming the charity you want to donate to is set up to receive investments, and you have investments in your taxable account that are worth more than what you paid for them, you can donate those investments directly to the charity. The charity is able to then sell the investments without having to pay taxes on the gains, while on your end, you receive credit for a charitable contribution equal to the value of the investments, but you also avoid having to pay taxes on the investment gains. So in that sense, it's a win-win for both sides, and bigger picture, you can almost think of it as the opposite of the tax loss harvesting strategy Andrew just discussed. With tax loss harvesting, you're looking to capture investment losses to deduct them from your taxes, while with donating appreciated shares to charity, you're looking to donate investments with underlying gains to avoid having to pay taxes on those gains. Again, we go in-depth on several more strategies in episode number 23, but the key takeaway for this checklist item is to review your charitable activity for the year, And if you're looking to donate more, look for opportunities to do it in a tax-efficient way. So far, we've gone through our list of the tangible and specific items. And now the last area we'll touch on is revisiting the bigger picture. You may be sensing a theme here, but this last item is another area that we've discussed several times in other episodes, which is the idea that financial planning is a fluid process that changes over time. Things are constantly changing, whether that's life situation, career, priorities, goals, etc., And even if you do a comprehensive deep dive on the front end of getting clear on what you want to accomplish financially and putting together a plan for getting there, nobody can perfectly predict the future and things are going to change over time. This is something we regularly discuss with our clients. However, if you don't work with an advisor, it's still just as important to do this periodic refresh where you step back and look at things from the big picture perspective. In practice, this consists of both the purely financial aspects and the softer non-financial aspects. Starting with the non-financial aspects, This consists of revisiting your goals and what you're currently working toward with your finances. Are the things you've been working toward still as important? Is retirement at 65 now retirement at 60, 55, or today? Or have things changed and now something else is more important? Perhaps your family has realized that it would be really nice to have a vacation home as a way to make more memories and spend more time together. Or perhaps your first grandchild was born and you would like to start saving for college. There are countless possibilities and it doesn't need to be this one-in, one-out type of situation where just because there's something new that you want to work toward doesn't mean that you have to abandon one of your existing goals. You can balance everything, and maybe that means adjusting or pushing out the timing of achieving an existing goal, but you might be happy with the trade-off if it means you're going to be able to do it all. And even if there aren't any new goals that you're adding to your list, you'll still want to revisit your existing goals to see if you continue to feel the same way. Perhaps you originally planned to retire at 65, but as you spent more years working in the job, you can no longer picture yourself working that long and decide that retiring or at least going part-time, at 55 or 60 would be better. Or maybe you've been planning to fund an in-state public school for college for your child, but as they get to high school, it's looking more like private school or going out of state is increasingly likely. As you can see from these two simple examples, even if existing goals don't change at a broad level, like your retirement date or being able to pay for college, the specifics of the goal can change and that can have a big impact on the financial side of the equation. Which that leads to the second part of this final checklist item, Once you've reassessed things from the softer, non-financial perspective, you'll want to then translate that into what it means from a financial perspective. There's some math involved here, and whether it's using financial planning software, an online calculator, or an Excel spreadsheet, you'll want to recalculate your required annual savings amount for your various goals based on how they've changed, and also think about the best strategy or account to use to accomplish them. For example, switching from a goal of paying for an in-state public school to a private school might mean saving an extra $10,000 each year to your child's 529. Moving your retirement date up from 65 to 55 might mean that in addition to maxing out your retirement employer accounts, you also have to start saving and investing to a taxable account. And adding the goal of buying a vacation home for your family might mean starting up a monthly transfer of a certain amount to the savings or investment account as a down payment. Whatever the specifics, you want to understand the savings required for your new or adjusted goals, then look across the big picture to understand whether you'll be able to meet those. And if not, then prioritize and decide on which trade-offs you'll make. This might sound like a lot of work, and to be honest, in some years, it is a lot more work because things are changing quickly. Priorities have shifted. However, in other years, you might realize that you feel the same way about things and don't have any new goals or changes to existing ones, and you instead continue to work the same plan. But either way, it's really helpful to do this annual step back and check in on the big picture to make sure that you continue to have alignment between the way you're using your money and what's most important to you, and year-end is a great time to do it. I have to say, year-end also sounds like a great opportunity to schedule an annual financial planning meeting with your spouse. Agree? (laughs) It's always a good time to schedule a financial planning meeting with your spouse. Never a bad time, right? Exactly. 
But joking aside, we know we like to give Jen and Jenny a hard time on the podcast, but if you're listening, we love you guys and we so appreciate your support and always being such good sports. Well, that covers all the items in our year-end financial planning checklist. We know we went through a lot, but these are some of the things we feel are most important and most helpful to be checking in on each year. So hopefully it gave you some good food for thought as we approach the end of the year. And just to give a quick recap of the checklist, number one is to confirm your contributions to employer retirement accounts. Check to see how much you've contributed year to date and how much you're on pace to contribute for the remainder of the year. If you aren't on track to make the maximum contributions and would like to, you can increase your per paycheck contributions. Number two, consider making your backdoor Roth IRA contribution. If you're planning to make a backdoor Roth IRA contribution, but haven't yet, consider doing it before year end. While you have until April 15th of next year to make this, doing it within the calendar year makes things easier from a tax reporting standpoint and also protects against an unknown future and possible changes to tax legislation. Number three, confirm your 529 plan contributions. Similar to your employer retirement accounts, if you're contributing to a 529 college savings account for kids or grandkids, check to see how much you've contributed so far this year. You have until December 31st to make contributions for the current tax year, so if you want to contribute more, whether that's to get to the $10,000 Michigan State income tax deduction level or some other amount, you have time to make those additional contributions for the current year. Number four, review your FSAs and HSAs. If you have a flexible spending account, whether for healthcare or dependent care, check to see if you have any money in the account, and if you do, be sure to spend it before year end so you don't risk losing it. And if you have a health savings account, check to see how much you've contributed relative to the annual contribution limit and increase your per paycheck contribution if needed. Number five, review your investments. Take a look at your investment portfolio to see if there's any need or opportunity to rebalance your investments back to your target allocation. And if you have a taxable investment account, see if you have any investments that are worth less than what you paid for them and are candidates for tax loss harvesting. Number six, review your charitable giving. If you're charitably inclined, check to see how much you've donated relative to your target number for the year. And if there's a gap, look for opportunities to give in the most tax efficient way, including donating appreciated investments if you have a taxable investment account and the charity can receive them. And lastly, number seven, step back and revisit your overall goals and life situation. So do a big picture reflection on your overall situation to see if your goals and priorities have changed. If they have, figure out how your required savings amounts have changed and make the needed adjustments in terms of savings and account strategy to meet your new goals. Well, thank you as always for joining us for another episode of the show. If you want to check out the show notes, you can find them at the podcast page of our website, mdwmlc.com slash podcast. And if you have thoughts to share or questions you'd like to have answered, you're welcome to email us at info at mdwmlc.com. Take care, everyone, and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to make smart financial decisions? Check out the resources section of MD Wealth Management's website at mdwmllc.com, where you'll find additional knowledge and insight for Michigan physicians, including a blog, ebook, and one-page guides. While there, you can also schedule a 15-minute conversation with Andrew and Trent to learn more about what it means to work with the firm and how they serve physicians. If you've enjoyed the content, please leave a review on iTunes and share with your friends and colleagues. Thanks so much for listening. Andrew Mushbaugh and Trent DeBruin are certified financial planners, principals, and co-founders of MD Wealth Management, a registered investment advisory firm in the state of Michigan. All opinions shared in the show are for general information and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future returns. Please consult with your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before making any decisions. 